Well, um, yes, my name is Jack Stuster. I am uh, retired as of the beginning of last year from Anacapa Sciences. Anacapa uh, is named for uh, an island off the coast of Santa Barbara, um, which is a Chumash Indian word that means visible through the fog. And for 50 years, Anacapa Sciences attempted to make things visible through the fog uh, for our military and other government um, uh, customers. <clears throat> and my, <clears throat> of course, I watched Sputnik in 1957 as a young boy. Uh, and I did follow the space program off and on through uh, elementary and junior high and high school and even in college, but it wasn't until uh, 1982. I had just begun working at Anacapa Sciences, which is a small um, applied behavioral sciences and human factors uh, research firm located here in Santa Barbara. Um, <clears throat> and it was in the early days of the space shuttle program between STS three and four as you might recall, those of you old enough to have been around then, um, it was taking months instead of weeks to refurbish the orbiter between missions. Uh, and there was a series of accidents and culminated with the death of, uh, of three technicians on the ground at Kennedy Space Center. And Rockwell International had the, uh, had the launch control contract they had built the orbiter and they called upon Anacapa Sciences to find out why it was taking so long to re refurbish the orbiter between missions. I was the newest guy on the payroll and cheapest guy on the payroll. So my boss uh, selected me to accompany him. We spent a couple of weeks at the Kennedy Space Center interviewing everyone from the director of launch operations to the people who swept the floor of the vehicle assembly building. <clears throat> And on our first day uh, meeting with the director of launch operations, a Rockwell uh, manager um, who was not particularly pleased that we were there, um, sent by his bosses to troubleshoot the program. Um, but he said, you know, where do you guys want to start? Here are your, uh, your passes and there's your escort, where do you want to start? And we looked at each other and said, well, the launch pad, of course. And so our escort drove us to the launch pad. Uh, Columbia was mated to the solids and the liquid um, tanks and on the pad. We took the elevator to the top and at each level walking down on that expanded metal stairs, uh, <sighs> We, I at one point I walked over to the orbiter, got as close as I could, and I was just so moved by the machine. It was such a, a wonderful and awesome uh, machine. I'm relatively patriotic. I, I was just proud to be a member of the species that could build such a wonderful uh, machine. And I let the escort and my boss walk ahead a little while and I actually pinched myself to make sure that this was actually happening to me because it was in the presence of this awe-inspiring um, equipment and I kind of vowed at that point that I really want I had only been on the on this project for a couple hours and uh, on the ground at KSC and I knew that I really wanted to remain involved um, <clears throat> Our report, uh, we, we identified 22 categories of issues that were slowing the, the refurbishment of the orbiter between missions um, and presented our results to Rockwell Management at the headquarters in Downey, California. And wh while we were there, I noticed a, a sign that said space station working group. And I thought, wow, they're, they're thinking of building a space station. Maybe that is how I can remain involved. We, um, we were told later that our, uh, our recommendations were helpful in uh, shortening the 
turnaround times, the refurbishment of the, of the orbiter between missions. They would have improved anyway because they were on a learning curve, but we were um, pleased to learn that we had contributed in some way. We also learned that Rockwell managers didn't really expect us to produce recommendations for the, for the way they do business. Um, we learned that, that they, they expected the product of our research to be a motivational poster or something like, you know, buckle down, do a good job, don't drop those wrenches and stuff like that. But um, anyway, so after that uh, study was concluded and our recommendations had, many of them had been implemented, I started calling around at NASA. This was before inter widespread use of the, or availability of internet. Um, and I started calling around trying to find if there was someone who was interested in the issues of small groups of living and working in isolation and confinement. And I would be told that, oh yeah, you really need to call so-and-so and I'd call up and then they'd say, no, and I had, it had taken me to the Ames Research Center in um, Northern California. And I had placed the call to the person who was supposedly the one cognizant uh, individual for that, for the behavioral issues. And I had called a few times and left messages uh, with no response. And I was about to give up on a Friday afternoon. I called again and he answered his own phone. And we chatted for more than an hour. And he said that he, yeah, they were really intending to look into the behavioral issues, but hadn't gotten to it yet. And why don't you write me a letter and describe how you would uh, go about this? And so over the weekend, I wrote a five page letter that described that, in which I mentioned that uh, in all uh, fields of serious inquiry, we look to metaphor when, or an analogies when access to the real thing is not possible. Engineers and architects build models of their buildings or, or ships or aircraft uh, and then subject them to wind tunnel tests and other stress tests. Um, medical researchers use what are called animal models. Even economists build mathematical models to test uh, hypotheses about pricing and availability. And in the behavioral sciences, we look to analogous conditions. When we don't have access to the real thing, either for physical or ethical reasons. And so I propose to study conditions on earth that are in different ways analogous to what we might reasonably expect of a low earth orbit space station. <clears throat> and uh, by got a call saying, would you and your boss come up and talk to us? We spent a day talking to them and they um, invited me to write a proposal uh, in which I elaborated on my letter uh, and described how I would go about doing this. And they mm -hmm. uh, awarded the, the contract. And I set about mm -hmm. identifying a dozen or so um, conditions on earth that are in different ways analogous fleet ballistic missile submarines, Antarctic research stations, underwater habitats, offshore research vessels, uh, long endurance fishing vessels, around the world yacht racers and some previous expeditions. And uh, at the end of that study uh, produced a report that include, included about 100 recommendations for the design of equipment and procedures for uh, low Earth orbit space station. It was very well received by the uh, NASA and, and contractor personnel who were working on uh, the designs of the, went through several iterations, uh, but what ultimately became known as the International Space Station. They liked the report because the recommendations were based on uh, real world experience. Now, sort of anecdotal, but real world, as opposed to just some psychologist's good idea. And so it was very well received. And many of the, uh, several of the recommendations actually made it through uh, all the design iterations uh, and are part of the International Space Station. Because that was such a uh, well-received report, 
um, NASA asked me to do the same thing, but for a three-year expedition to Mars. And in looking at the, uh, the, the different types of, uh, excuse me, in looking at the dimensions by which I had described the uh, conditions analogous to a space station, it was really the duration of the mission that, uh, that drove the, the selection of analogs, you know, defined essentially what the analogs would be for an ex a three-year expedition to Mars. And it turns out it was the expeditions of the past or the only, and voyages of discovery were the only uh, real conditions analogous in that regard to uh, long duration in, or interplanetary uh, expeditions. And so I started um, chronologically with uh, Columbus's first voyage of discovery. And I use this illustration to remind me to uh, tell an audience that uh, NASA did not invent the uh, method of triple redundancy to, to ensure reliability. Um, Columbus never would have left Spain with fewer than three hulls and, um, and would not have returned had he done so. It's not widely known, but the Santa Maria, his flagship, went aground and broke up on Christmas Day, 1492, because the uh, crew had partied the night before celebrating Christmas and left the watch to a cabin boy who didn't know what to do when the wind came up and blew the ship onto the shore. Uh, and at that time, one of his captains had already left on his own to look for gold. And um, so Columbus and the crew were um, wondering how they were gonna get back to Spain. And they start, actually started building a small ship from the wreckage of the Santa Maria. And uh, that's when Pinzon, the captain who had who had uh, not mutinied, but left on his own, uh, came around the bend and it was just by chance that they uh, were reunited and then went back in the two smaller ships. Although the voyage, out, outward bound voyage was only 33 days and the total uh, expedition was about seven months, there still is a lot to learn even from Columbus's uh, expedition. He had to deal with strong-willed subordinates, and um, that's, that's something that is usually common to an expedition. What I concluded was that expeditions um, are, resemble in many ways the, uh, the, uh, what we might expect of the isolation and confinement for uh, future space explorers. I also looked at expeditions such as the Lewis and Clark expedition. Now it's a 40 explorers, which is quite a bit larger crew than we would expect of, a, of an interplanetary uh, expedition. Uh, but the duration was about the same, 28 months. Um, they met many native peoples along the way who helped them. That's probably not gonna happen on an expedition to Mars, although some people are hopeful. Um, and they uh, described everything in their journals, which we're going to come to in a little while, um, and the importance of keeping a, a record. Uh, lessons from the um, uh, Lewis and Clark expedition are the importance of strong leadership and planning, um, perseverance, uh, living off the land. Now that's they're not going to be able to, uh, ex explorers of Mars are not going to be able to hunt buffalo or elk as the Corps of Discovery did, um, but to the extent possible to live off the land. And in Mars, it would be, uh, on Mars, it would be um, uh, capturing uh, minerals and water in particular. And having a spirit of the expedition that was known as the Corps of Discovery, the group, the 40 explorers of the Lewis and Clark expedition. And they had a, a common understanding of what their mission was, why they were doing this, and 
uh, how important it was. And it's not a, a coincidence that the astronauts who in 1999 were preparing for the first expeditions to the International Space Station decided to call themselves the Expedition Corps to distinguish themselves from the shuttle astronauts who would come and go for seven to 14 days at a time. Um, they recognized that uh, an expeditionary mentality was needed uh, for even a six month expedition to the International Space Station. One of my favorite uh, explorers was Jules Sebastian Cesar Dumont de Urville, uh, remarkable in many ways. Uh, it, yep, when he was a young lieutenant, um, he was approached by some villagers on an island in the in the Mediterranean, uh, wanting to know if he wanted to, if he'd be interested in purchasing the statue, and uh, he was. And in dragging it to the ship, the arms were broken off, and it's the famous Venus de Milo. He was the <clears throat> the leader of two expeditions. Uh, to the South Pacific. Um, he was uh, a linguist and scientist in his own right and demonstrated uh, the kinds of leadership skills needed that have emerged later uh, among uh, expedition leaders, um, but always being seen in control. He described in his journal an occasion where they were about to go on the rocks and they were warping off with with cables and and um, and every and there were headhunters on the shore waiting for them to founder and uh, he had to maintain his cool uh, calm decision making under those conditions uh, but in his journal he was he revealed the terror that he felt and he also had a, a keen sense of the importance of habitability uh, this rendering of, of the Corvette's astrolabe and zile uh, was painted by the ship's surgeon. The, uh, the French had learned early on that it was uh, very problematic to have civilians on expeditions uh, because the military and civilian people didn't get along and the civilian people were uh, outside the chain of command and wouldn't do always what they were told. And so the French, uh, their solution was to identify young officers who had propensities for science or art or whatever, and then train them so that uh, they were within the chain of command. And this is before photography, obviously, when everything was rendered in drawings and paintings. Another relevant expedition, uh, we know it as the Voyage of the Beagle, but the British surveying expedition, um, a young Charles Darwin was uh, the uh, expedition naturalist. And he, was, he uh, was assigned quarters with the captain, Robert Fitzroy. And it was very, very crowded in the, in the cabin. And he, Fitzroy was disagreeable. He thought slavery was a wonderful institution. And uh, of course, Darwin uh, was aghast and did everything he could to spend as much time as possible on shore for which we and science have benefited immensely. And I have this here because even though uh, Darwin grew to be a very old man, uh, once returning to England, he never set foot on a ship again. One of the most relevant of all the expeditions, uh, the, the known as the Belgian Antarctic Expedition or the Belgica Expedition, the name of, their, of the ship, uh, was the first to winter over in Antarctica and uh, the, one of the first to have a multinational crew and that way is uh, relevant to future expeditions as well. Um, the, crew was not really prepared for the experience of wintering over. As a matter of fact, many of the crew didn't know that they had that they were going to do that. <clears throat> and the members of the crew one by one slipped into a, a depression. A, one man died from what they believed to be a heart ailment. Others, uh, a, another man became uh, 
psychotic and hid in the recesses of of the ship's hold in order to uh, avoid others and one by one slipped into a, a deep depression that uh, aff afflicted everyone except the uh, the uh, ship surgeon frederick cook and cook did what he could to uh alleviate this he he thought it had something to do with the absence of the sun and so he would have the most seriously afflicted individuals stand naked with a overcoat over their shoulders uh, exposing their skin to the ship's stove thinking that that might help uh, he had, he imposed a uh, this is before vitamins had been discovered uh, but for centuries ship's captains knew that something was missing uh, from the diet um, and so he he encouraged the mem the members of the crew to eat fresh penguin meat, even in the depth of the winter. Uh, some of them did. Um, he had encouraged them to go out on the ice and walk, and the the that practice devolved into a circular path around the ship that became known as the Madhouse Promenade. Uh, later, Roald Amundsen, who served as the ship's uh, first mate, his apprenticeship essentially as an explorer, he later wrote that in, insanity and disease stalked the decks of the Belgica that winter. This is Frederick Cook before and after. I like to include this because the after picture looks exactly like one of my college roommates. And uh, the Whatever it was that uh, Cook did was helpful. One by one, the, as the spring approached, the, the crew members sh uh, shrugged off their malaise and uh, got back to working and working as hard as they could to extract themselves from the ice because they knew that spending another winter in, in Antarctica would be fatal for many of them. And uh, Cook was credited with saving the expedition from sheer collapse. A fellow by the name of Julian Sanction read uh, what I had written about the Belgica expedition in a book uh, a few years ago, and just last year published Madhouse at the End of the Earth, which is a very detailed account of the Belgica expedition. <clears throat> I was giving the talk a talk about my analog research one time, and a, a friend of mine, uh, Dr. Desmond Lugg, who was the medical director for the Australian Antarctic Division for many, many years, afterwards said, you know, that you're such an American and your approach to your research is so American. And I said, well, what do you mean? He said, well, you completely ignored Douglas Mawson and the Australasian Antarctic Expedition of 1911 and 1914. And I said, well, really? I'm I'm sorry. And he's, no, it's just all part of this general pattern of Americans. Um, and then I later learned that, you know, in Australia and Tasmania, uh, they, they had to sue Warner Brothers in order to get the right to use the words Tasmanian devil for this extinct animal that marsupial animal from Tasmania. Uh, when they go into the store, it's Betty Crocker this and General Mills that, and it's the, uh, I was unaware of this form of imperialism and uh, narrow-mindedness that we uh, bring, that many of us bring to the task, and I vowed not to do that again. And I, so I read, uh, immediately read Douglas Mawson's uh, account of, of uh, his expedition to seek the uh, South Magnetic Pole at the same time that Robert Falcon Scott and Roald Amundsen were racing to be the first to the South, the geographic South Pole. Uh, Douglas Mawson led an expedition uh, to find the, uh, to visit the South Magnetic Pole, which happens to be located uh, in an area of Antarctica characterized by the worst weather in the world. <clears throat> and there was much, there is much to learn from Mawson's expedition. Uh, for example, uh, 
while on traverse with with dog sleds, um, three dog sleds going along, and Mawson looks back, and his friend is behind him, and he looks back again, and the guy's gone. It, the dog sled is gone, and the dogs are gone, and he backtracked and found that they had fallen into a crevasse. They were all dead, of course, and all of their food was with them, and the cooking implements. Um, all that Mawson had was some dog food on his sled, and then he fell into a crevasse. Anyway, so there was much to learn. And that winter, when they were back, when he was back at their hut, uh, what, their radio operator uh, developed a very disruptive psychosis, and it was a small hut, and it just about drove the rest of the the entire expedition um, off the deep end. And so uh, the Mawson wrote in no department can a leader spend more time profitably than in the selection of men who are to accomplish the work. Much of their, of their problem uh, originated with the blizzard that knocked out their equipment. And so they couldn't even perform the scientific tasks uh, that they had planned to perform. And Mawson also said that weather affects everything. And those of you who are, have studied Mars mission planning are well aware that uh, Mars has weather. Even the International Space Station has weather. There have been several occasions when the crew has had to retreat to uh, hardened portions of the station to um, to protect themselves against uh, solar particle events, and that will be a that will be the case on an expedition to Mars where the crew is exposed for long periods of time, um, and on the surface uh, from the from the dust storms. Roald Amundsen uh, mentioned him previously as the mate on the Belgica. He's the most successful of all. Uh, explorers of the heroic age, uh, first across the North, Northwest Passage, first to the South Pole, first over the North Pole in an Italian dirigible that he had renamed the Norge. Um, um, interesting story uh, there. It was previously known as the Italia and Umberto, which was uh, designed and captained by Umberto Nobile, uh, Amundsen, Chartered it for the for the expedition, um, and much of of uh, Amundsen's autobiography uh, is devoted to uh, <laughs> describing what an idiot Nobile was, and uh, and then uh, after the Norgay, uh, he attempted to fly on two Dornier. Uh, flying boats across the north, but there, one of the aircraft um, had to make a uh, crash landing on the ice, and so the other came down as well, and they spent two weeks uh, preparing, uh, there was, they were okay, but they spent two weeks preparing a, a, a uh, strip of ice so that they could take off in the surviving uh, airship, or not airship, but uh, aircraft. And um, at home, they thought that, of course, those Amundsen and his guys were, were dead. And so two weeks later, when they showed up back in Norway, uh, there was great rejoicing. And then soon after, Nobile uh, uh, tried to cross the, the North Pole uh, in another airship, and he crashed. And uh, Amundsen was called upon to, you know, go looking for him, and uh, and that's uh, when Amundsen perished. Ironically, there been a move. There was a Russian, a joint Russian movie called The Red Tent that describes the uh, a Russian French movie, uh, The Red Tent, that uh, documents the the. Nobile rescue. Okay, um, so uh, this is a great uh, typical shot of a arc of a polar explorer uh, 
um, which pretty much set the tradition for NASA of posing and heroically in, in uh, expedition garb. And having worked in the field of human factors psychology for 40 years, uh, I'm really grateful to Roald Amundsen for giving us such a wonderful quote. Uh, the human factor is three quarters of any expedition. Uh, Ernest Shackleton um, is probably the most, well, Amundsen is the most successful explorer of that era. Um, Ernest Shackleton is probably the most uh, beloved, largely because of his, um, his leadership style. He had an interesting way of, of selecting people for his expeditions. Um, in addition to looking into their qualifications, uh, he would ask them impertinent questions and see how they reacted. Uh, like, you know, why do you wear glasses? You know, if the person was defensive about it, that might not be the person you want to share your tent with uh, for long periods of time. But if they were, they said, well, so I could see better or some other uh, uh, response, uh, they might be the kind of person you want. Uh, interesting, the, but NASA employs a, cert, a similar technique in the last phase of their uh, selection. Person is seated in a chair with the panel in a, sur surrounding them, and they're asked sometimes impertinent questions. For example, Bill Shepard, the former, the, the first commander of the ISS in the year 2000, a former Navy SEAL, uh, there were people on the selection board who asked, uh, one person asked, you know, so what is it really that you do well? And he said, well, uh, kill people with a knife. <laughs> and that was so so much of a Ernest Shackleton type response that, uh, anyway, moving along. Um, now, Shackleton never made it to any of his destinations, but he never lost a man on any of his expeditions either. Um, the British Trans-Antarctic Expedition of 1914 to 1916, uh, known as the Endurance Expedition for the name of the ship. The ship was beset in the uh, wet, wet L Sea before they could reach the continent. The ship, they stayed on board for a while and then they moved onto the ice flow and then they moved all their gear that they could onto the ice and watched their ship sink. And they, they stayed with their three uh, cutters, auxiliary boats uh, on the ice uh, as the flow gradually got smaller and smaller and uh, eventually broke up under their feet. They took to their boats and made it through the ice uh, to a tiny island, Elephant Island, off uh, in the Antarctic Ocean. And they barely made it there, but they made it because of Shackleton's leadership style, uh, always being seen in command, always uh, helping um, and uh, caring for the well being of his crew members. Uh, they reached. Uh, Elephant Island and realized that, that they would die if they stayed there. And so he left. Um, they fixed up one of their cutters that James cared. Uh, and with five, of, with five, four other crew members uh, made it, left the crew at Elephant Island. And uh, he and the others took off for a thousand mile open boat voyage, one of the most remarkable uh, in all of history, uh, to make it uh, to a, a, the Stromness whaling station uh, on an island and that they had visited on the way down. And that's a whole story. And I recommend that if you're interested in, in adventure stories, uh, this is a true life adventure story. <clears throat> and uh, so for the, these reasons, Shackleton is, is uh, revered among explorers for his uh, his leadership abilities. And they came back to having not lost one person on their, that entire arduous uh, experience as castaways. <clears throat> 
Uh, they came back and World War I was raging. I uh, also look at uh, uh, Richard Byrd's, Admiral Byrd's uh, expeditions to uh, Antarctica. <clears throat> um, in one of the expeditions, he designed a experiment in isolation and confinement, a small hut 100 miles from Little America called Advance Base. And he didn't want to subject anyone else to the, the, the conditions. So he himself um, lived there. And uh, it was a bad idea because he almost killed himself uh, when he, uh, three different ways, he locked, he went outdoors uh, from the hut and the door froze shut. He couldn't get back in, uh, except with great difficulty. He almost killed himself with the fumes of his stove and also from a gasoline powered generator that was outside the door, but in a tunnel. Um, and it affected his, uh, it affected him. And they, the crew at Little America knew that something was wrong because he had more, he would, uh, had scheduled Morris, Morris code hails using a wireless um, and he would miss his appointed times. And then his, his Morris code would be the equivalent of slurred speech. And so they knew something was wrong. And after three attempts, they finally rescued him. And he, uh, he left us though with a, a the most um, descriptive account of life in isolation and confinement at its worst in a book that alone in which he described uh, time was no longer like a river running but a deep still pool. This was in the era when expeditions were largely financed by uh, lecture tours and books afterwards. And one of those was, uh, and the one that I am ending with here is the Norwegian Polar Expedition of 1893 to 1896. It is a model for all future uh, expeditions on and off the earth. Fridtjof Nansen was a, a scientist, uh, one of the earliest uh, proponents of the modern theory, theory of neurology. Uh, his dissertation was on uh, fish, uh, fish neurology. He was the first to cross Greenland um, and <clears throat> wanted to test a theory of polar drift. It's hard for us in the 21st century to imagine what life was like in the closing days of the 19th century. There were still many, many unexplored uh, uh, regions of the world and unexplained uh, mysteries. Among them was the what was at the North Pole. And um, there were speculation that it was a vast open sea, that it was a continent, or that it was just ice. A few, um, 20 years earlier, an expedition uh, had left San Francisco and headed north in, and became beset in uh, the pack off of Alaska, uh, off of north of Alaska. And the wreckage of that ship appeared several years later on the other side of the of the Arctic, which um, suggested that the polar region is covered by an ice cap that moves slowly across um, uh, in a westerly direction. And uh, so he wanted to test that. And the problem with polar expeditions of the past uh, of the previous to his and even afterwards was that the ships could not withstand the pressure of the ice on the hull and they would break up when they were beset. And so he set about to design a ship specifically for this uh, purpose uh, with a rounded bottom and a, a, a uh, recessed keel and with fittings that could be removed so that ice could not make a purchase on, on the uh, hull. And uh, he designed the ship, named it the Fram, uh, had financing from the Norwegian government, but um, had cost overruns, just like in modern days, because they wanted to increase the margin for safety. And <clears throat> they um, 
at a point uh, closer to Alaska than Norway, they headed into the pack ice and purposefully became beset. And as the pressure of the ice uh, increased on the hull, it, the ship rose up out of the ice and remained cradled there as the ice drifted across the top of the world. After, oh, and uh, life was actually pretty pleasant on board uh, the Fram. Um, they celebrated uh, all Norwegian holidays, of course, is everyone's birthday. They were looking for occasions to break the monotony. They all ate together at a time when expeditions, such as the Belgian Ant Antarctic expedition, was composed of the officers and then the men or the sailors before the mast. Um, on the front, the Fram was designed with all the rooms opening onto the wardroom or the salon, it was called. Um, and uh, it was a very egalitarian. Uh, and they ate together and the, uh, had meaningful scientific work. The engineer the, even uh, disassembled the steam engine twice and reassembled it, oiled it. Um, everyone had uh, something to do. They actually uh, engaged in organized uh, exercise as well. Um, but when it appeared that their course was not going to take them uh, to the north, across the North Pole, uh, <clears throat> uh, Nansen selected one other member, Hallimar Johansson, to accompany him with dog sleds uh, on a dash to the pole. And they <clears throat> they made it to beyond the farthest north of that that anyone had ever made, but they were only making a kilometer a day over rough ice. Uh, and they turned back and made it to a uh, an um, an island, um, front Franz Joseph land, and they made it to an island and built a, a hut a six by 10 foot hut out of stones and walrus hides. They laid in a supply of, of polar bear and walrus meat uh, for the winter and then hunkered down in, in their six by 10 foot hut, the two of them. Their entire world illuminated by the pale glow of a blubber lamp that splattered oil all over the interior of the hut and all over them. They had nothing to wash themselves with. They found that the best way to clean themselves was to scrape their skin with a knife uh, and then recycle that blubber into their, their lamp. They had nothing to read, no change of clothes, and extreme monotony was their uh, companion for uh, that entire winter. They would sleep 17 hours out of 24 because they was, there was just nothing to do. And uh, but when spring came, they, they uh, ventured outdoors and they fixed up their, their kayaks and uh, headed south. But um, Nansen, by the way, was, a, was remarkable in many ways. And one of them was that he was an artist. These etchings uh, are renderings by uh, Fridjof Nansen. They sell, as I mentioned, they celebrated the birthdays and, and Norwegian holidays. They ran out of Norwegian holidays, and so they had an almanac and they started celebrating the holidays of other countries. And um, they always had good food. The saddest day of the expedition was when they ran out of beer. Um, Nansen was not a big fan of distilled spirits, um, but they always had, even when they ran out of wine to go with their dinners, they, uh, they made a, uh, they made, <laughs> they made up their own using alcohol for uh, scientific alcohol uh, laced with um, cloudberry jam. And they had, they had a thousand volume library on board and they had musical instruments and Nansen wrote in his journal at one point that he felt guilty. The folks at home were probably having it even harder than they were um, snug in their little habitat on crossing the top of the world. And truly the whole secret lies in arranging things sensibly and especially in being careful about the food. <laughs> 
uh, Nansen and his crew uh, of the Fram were reunited. And then uh, the, day, the day that uh, they returned after three years and three months, uh, the Fram was the Nansen and his crew were greeted truly as if they had just returned from another planet. I checked, I searched microfilm from that period uh, from the UCSB library special collections. And it was, it was as if they had just come back from another planet. So Nansen, a wonderful guy, explorer, neurologist. Uh, oh, they, oceanographers still use what is called a Nansen bottle to obtain deep sea water samples. Uh, the Nansen cooker is still used to extract the last little BTU out of your fuel um, in a polar area. Uh, he was one of the popularizers of skiing as a sport instead of a form of rural transportation. After World War I, um, he was involved in the repatriation of prisoners of war and discovered that in the new Soviet Union, there was a famine going on. And although the Soviets would not allow the Red Cross uh, to help, uh, Nansen, the famous polar explorer, was able to uh, organize a relief effort that saved millions of, of uh, citizens of the new Soviet Union. Later, he was helpful in, in uh, dealing with the uh, refugees of the uh, Armenian genocide, uh, for which all of those things uh, he was awarded uh, the Nobel Peace Prize. Wonderful guy. And he was handsome, as can be. I mean, you look at him, he'd have a great future in any era, I think. Rock musician of his era. So um, what I found was that the details will be different, but most of the problems that will confront uh, the future explorers of space are the same problems that troubled explorers in the past. It won't be a gasoline powered uh, electrical generator that poisons people, but some other form of outgassing. Um, and uh, it'll just be very similar. There's much to learn from expeditions of the past uh, to the design of equipment and procedures for future ex expeditions. Um, some of the um, recommendations from the analog studies, of, it's important to establish a spirit of the expedition. You have to select not just qualified, but also compatible personnel. You have to test, train, and simulate everything. One of Robert Falcon Scott's problems was that he didn't test before getting to Antarctica. Um, pay special attention to the food, eat meals together, which helps foster solidarity and, and uh, mitigates the natural tendency for subgroup formation, which can be in its extreme um, dangerous. Remain busy and entertained with meaningful work and meaningful entertainment and realize that good leadership can be more important than good habitability. You must expect that problems will occur um, and expect weather to affect everything. Be prepared for casualties. Distribute stowage of supplies and equipment. That's something that the Australians learned pen, uh, painfully. And at Antarctic stations, but research stations, by the way, they don't put all of any one commodity in one place. It's distributed so that they don't lose all of anything if there is a localized fire, for example live off the land and design for redundancy and maintainability. These and other um, issues are described in the book I wrote in, based on a tech report I wrote for NASA, um, published in 1997 and then in paperback in uh, 10 years ago. It's still in print. It's in the library of the uh, International Space Station and uh, was actually considered re required reading for the astronauts who were members of the Expedition Corps preparing for expeditions to the ISS.
<clears throat> just as uh, expeditions of the past served as models or analogs for future expeditions, um, Am I running out of time? Uh, we've got a few more minutes here. Uh, okay, I'll, I'll be very brief because I don't think I'll have time to do the, the rest of that. Um, the, anyway, I did a content analysis of, French, of diaries maintained by the leaders and physicians at French remote duty stations in the South Indian Ocean and in Antarctica. Um, Claude Bachelard depicted here on the um, International Biomedical Expedition to the Antarctic in 1980-81 um, selected a proposal I had written because they found that that the journals were the very best sources of behavioral data during this uh, uh, long duration traverse. <clears throat> um, and so for the expedition year 1993, the leaders and physicians at the French remote duty stations main, kept journals for this purpose that Claude and I subjected to uh, a systematic analysis of the content. Up until this time, um, engineers would ask behavioral scientists, you know, what's the mo most important issue uh, that we should consider? And psychologists would always say, well, you know, group, you know, interpersonal relations, that's the most important. And they would, the engineers would say, great, how do you know that? And what's the second most important issue? And they couldn't answer the question. And so uh, a content ana analysis is a, uh, a good way to, to approach this. Uh, it's a science journal, maintaining a journal is a scientific approach to the experience. And it's the traditional method of explorers, pilots, engineers and scientists. And uh, so I analyzed the data from the, uh, Claude and I analyzed the data from the French diaries and found uh, that group interaction was the number one issue. And they were, and we could list the other you know, 20 or so other issues uh, in order of their importance to the uh, members of the expedition based on quantitative data. And so I proposed to do the same thing for the International Space Station, where the International Space Station would now serve as an analog or a metaphor for long duration uh, space expeditions, for example, to Mars. And um, I promised that I would make the astronauts that who participated in the study that I would, um, that their anonymity would be preserved, that I would be the only person who would read their journals and that uh, they would get their journal back at the end of the, the study or at the end of their expedition. Um, the method is I would take a, a journal entry, which was anything from a few sentences to a few pages, and then parse the sentences into statements. And the statements I then coded for the primary categories, secondary category, usually, and sometimes a third level category um, for the tone, positive, negative, or neutral of the statement and the day of the expedition. Also, whether it was the commander or the flight engineer. For example, we were talking about the IP phone at dinner. We were talking, group interaction, about the IP phone, that's outside communications. That's the device that astronauts use to talk to their family on earth, for example at dinner, food. So that would have a primary group interaction, secondary category of uh, outside communications, and thir third level would be uh, at dinner. The tone we were talking about, that's, that's neutral. If we were arguing about the IP phone, that would be negative. More likely, if we were praising the, the IP phone, which they really, they really value it, that would be positive. And on what day of the of the expedition um, that enabled me to analyze by category, identify subcategories, and also track uh, what I, a metric that I called net positivity negativity. The data are obtained unobtrusively. The entries demonstrate that the subjects are actually attending to the task, unlike say a questionnaire where you don't really know. And uh, the subjects would benefit from their participation by having a, a detailed account of this once in a lifetime uh, event and 
as it turns out, there were therapeutic values as well. Um, so that's the first level of analysis is simply to, to take all the count, all the category assignments. Um, and uh, work was the category that was assigned most frequently outside communications, adjustment, and group interaction in that order. Now, this, when the study began, I was asked, when the study was selected, I was asked by NASA, I was asked, how, uh, how many subjects do you want? In the behavioral sciences, we want as many subjects as possible. Um, but that was, I had to be realistic. And uh, I found that in medical research, which is much of the research that's done by NASA um, on space medicine issues, um, that as few as 10 or even fewer subjects was considered okay. And so I didn't want to be laughed out of the proceedings. So I said 10 and even so 10 with only two person crews, one astronaut, one cosmonaut, that's a minimum of five years to get 10 subjects, 10 if everything goes well. <clears throat> and um, it, it did go well, it took seven years. Uh, some people are just not cut out for writing, maintaining a personal journal, but the astronauts and the research office uh, were very pleased with the utility of the results and asked me to continue. And at this time, um, the station had increased in size and also increased in crew size to six. So there's a basis of comparison two and three person crews versus six person crews. And so the second 10 subjects, members of six person crews, um, that began, well, anyway, uh, slightly different, um, but not very different. Here's a comparison of the phase one and phase two orders. Um, Uh, the same categories in slightly different uh, order uh, at the top of the list. And it's instructive to know uh, um, what, what is most important to the astronauts, uh, the members of the crew. It's also important to look at those categories that are, you know, low depth, uh, not so far up on the list as I expected. For example, in phase one, I expected privacy and personal space to be a bigger issue than it was. It was an issue at Antarctic stations and in, on uh, submarines and other analogs, but it wasn't so, uh, so much on the ISS. Well, there were only two and three people on board at that time in phase one, and each one of them could have a module to themselves that, uh, to sleep in at night. They'd hang their sleeping bags from the bulkhead. And, um, and uh, might even go all day without seeing each other until dinner time. So it wasn't, privacy was not an issue. So I figured during phase two with, with six person crews, surely privacy and personal space would be a bigger issue, but it was even uh, less frequently assigned as a category. And that, explained by the fact that the station grew in size, modules were added, but most important, private sleep quarters were added in both the Russian and the uh, US European se sections. And having a, a space, a small space to call your own, even uh, the size, size of, a, of a telephone booth uh, would, is enough to uh, mitigate the effects of crowding. This is usually where I have to pause and, and explain what a telephone booth is. Um, they used to have them on the street corners and stuff. You can go inside about 84 cubic feet. Um, so each of the categories could then be subjected to a subcategory analysis. These sections you see here are represent the, uh, the quarters of the mission. I would take however many days a mission was and divide by four and then analyze by quarter and then combine the data. And so in phase, this is phase one, two and three person crews. Uh, they described their work. Uh, they talked a lot about the schedule. A lot of the work was tedious and frustrating with only two or three people on board. Uh, there was a lot of uh, mundane things. You have to inventory the light bulbs and the underwear and stuff. Um, uh, 
they thought that it was a waste of their time to do a lot of that stuff. Uh, not many occasions for teamwork uh, when there's only two or three. In phase two, uh, looking at the work statements, they still spend a lot of, of time describing, but there was a lot more occasion, they're describing their work, a lot more occasions for teamwork. And uh, the tedious and frustrating tasks were now shared by, instead of over two or three uh, crew members, over six crew members. So they weren't, they weren't uh, as odious as they were. Recreation, and I'm gonna go quickly here, recreation and leisure, um, photography, earth photography, watching movies and earth viewing were the leading um, recreation pastimes in phase one. Uh, and the astronauts would take great pride and in showing their Russian uh, crewmates, American movies, uh, especially science fiction movies. Uh, 2001, A Space Odyssey, generally considered to be the best ever um, by astronauts. Um, and in phase two, Earth viewing and photography, still uh, the leading pastimes, but watching movies had uh, declined. Uh, quite a bit Be, with the larger crews, they didn't get together as uh, stopped getting together as frequently. Um, uh, they do still watch movies. Here's a picture of of the crew, the ISS watching The Martian uh, the day before it premiered on Earth. And um, but in terms of sporting events, this is a sad. You can't really see it probably, but this is a pretty sad photo. This is Scott Kelly's. Uh, uh, Super Bowl party. Uh, nobody showed up <laughs> to watch it except Scott. Um, football is so quintessentially American. Um, it doesn't doesn't attract the or interest the international crews. Uh, however, World Cup and Olympics, Winter and Summer Olympics are big hits and the crews get together to watch. Now, astronauts do spend a lot of time watching programming uh, while they exercise. It's a way of combining the act, two act, activities. And they were big fans of, oh, the Sopranos and the Italian, Giard, Giarda, the Italian chef. She's, anyway, this, uh, this figure illustrates the relationship of crew size to the amount of science that's conducted um, when you have more crew members. Oh, and that image in the background is what the space station looked like in 1999, when I spoke to the astronaut office, and uh, they gave me that sign, uh, that image, signed by the astronaut corps, and uh, people came up after the talk to have me autograph their copies of my book, which <laughs> I it was again another one of those uh, pinch myself experiences. I mentioned the. Uh, hey Jack. Coding for yeah, time to quit. Okay, I. Uh, it's very interesting. What, uh, as much as I okay. love this, uh, I think uh, I don't know how many slides you have left, but uh, oh, I have a couple more. But I'm just going to say that there's a, a a phenomenon that we discovered it emerged from the French Diaries data, and was also evident in the Phase One and Phase Two of of the Journal's flight experiment, that there is a decline in morale during the third quarter. Uh, as evidenced by the analysis of the uh, uh, coding of of the uh, statements for positive positivity, negativity, and neutrality, uh, don't know what it means. Seventeen out of twenty astronauts exhibited it on Do you guys adjustment want to statements. To a live stream of a astronaut plan for Mars. I'm sorry. We just muted Kelly there. Uh, there we go ahead if we uh, are uh, wrapping up. Yes. Yeah. Hey, Jack, it's Terry. Um, just let you know, too. We also see. Oh, that's what you look like. Okay. Hi, Terry. <laughs> hey, boss. Yeah. We uh, we also experienced the third quarter effect in two of the, two of, of the three last uh, analogs at UND. Um, so mm. just it's, it's valid. Yes, sir. Yeah, well, I thought I had really hit upon something when the data 
when I analyze the data, like, wow, this is, it, it is actionable. There are things that you want, you can do to uh, mitigate that, um, which I've recommended. But I started thinking about it. Now, I don't think it's limited, restricted to um, isolation and confinement. I recall when I was a, an undergraduate, uh, we had 10 week quarters and that seventh week or so, I think everybody's morale was down. You didn't accomplish all that you had to and yet you had term papers to write yet and there was a decline and took a, a road trip with my family uh, once and three quarters of the way through our morale was down. So it might just be something that's structural that under all circumstances, if you know approximately how long this endeavor is going to last, um, three quarters of the way through, it's kind of a human response to um, have a slight dip in morale. And I've seen it too. I've seen it too in some of my past assignments, my military assignments. Mm -hmm. I was, after reading about this, I'm, I'm able to reflect back and say, oh yeah, that's what was going on. Even, yeah. even though it was remote, say it was in Thule, Greenland or Shimi, Alaska, there still was quite a few people there. It wasn't uh, isolate, you know, a, a, a small group. It was hundreds of people, but it still happened. Yeah. Well, anyway, there's a whole lot more. Uh, <laughs> And I didn't even uh, talk about my Mars, the most recent study, which is the Mars task analysis. And, uh, but if you, anybody wants uh, copies of the reports, uh, if you just write to me, I had an email address that I was gonna show you that, um, 